Pete, Melt. Hey, thanks for coming to Bar Stocks with me. I'm always glad when we can get together. You bet. It's fun. So how about our uh, sorry fantasy baseball teams? Oh, sorry is the word. Although, I do have to say, this week I might get my first win in a month and a half. Woo! Yeah. All right. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> Well, I could. Uh, it's two wins. Oh, I have some uh, players that I don't think are long for my team. Is an 18.3 ERA good? <laughs> oh, you have to be kidding. Not good. That is insanity. All right, so you know how uh, a couple Sabbaths ago, uh, remember that when Greg was talking about Moses' conversation with God and he's asking God to see him? Oh, oh yeah, I remember that. But. It was only God's back, right? Yeah, he puts his hand up. I'm going to oh, stash yeah. you in that little cleft. I'm going to go by, I'm going to put my hand up. But that got me thinking, do you have, in, do you have an expectation of what God looks like? You know, that's a good question. I actually do. Okay. All right? Now, here's how I picture it. Heaven, okay. I'm there, and I see him, and I'm going to, I want a big hug. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. All okay. right. And and I don't want it on the throne. I don't want it in the city. I don't want a street. I want it over by the river where that tree is. Right. And I see him walking towards me and I'm going to give him and he's going to give me the biggest bear hug ever. Nice. Ever. Nice. You know, that's great. I, he, he's going to look at me and say, I I'm so happy you chose me. And I'm going to say, I'm glad I chose you too. Now, where's the fruit on that tree? <laughs> what month is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's where the food is. That's right. Nice. What about so, you? Well, that's interesting because you talk about hugging involves arms. You talk about God walking over and that's legs. And, and that's what we're used to. That's our vocabulary, our visual vocabulary of uh, people. But I don't, I don't have like an expectation of that that he has like necessarily arms or legs. He might, great, and I want a big hug too. I don't have a specific expectation of what he looks like, but I want to recognize him. Is that weird? Is that a contradiction? Well, I mean that kind of makes sense. I get it. Uh, if you don't get a hug, I'll give you one. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So as you uh, saw earlier, this conversation is true. And uh, it got us to thinking about how we recognize God. Sure. And we discussed it for a while. We did. We got further than a hug, that's for sure. <laughs> right. And one of the things we started with is the basics. How do we recognize anything? So we were pondering that. And that got us to thinking, we want to show you something. Look at that. Look at him. Now, does anybody know, happen to know who that is? Anybody not named Janice? Hey, maybe I, I can give you a hint. There's a hint. <laughs> is there a resemblance there? <laughs> that little dude is Milt and Janice's grandson, Zachary James Hinkle. Now, how old or young is he? He's about two and a half months old. Okay. What? One month? He's about one. Oh, in the picture. In the picture, he's one month old. Okay. Okay. All right, so he's one month old. He's one, and, he, and he's already made it into a sermon, so good for him. It, it, it could only get worse if, she asked, if someone asked me how long I've been married. I didn't okay. ask. I'm not asking. All right, don't do it. Don't I do don't want to know. <laughs> about five minutes more. <laughs> So, um, Jason, I asked Jason, Zachary's dad, if he could, uh, I asked him, we were out talking about something else, I asked him how Zachary was doing and he texted me that shot. So, and I asked Jason if we could show a picture of Zach and he said, oh sure. So, but I had that picture on my phone and I show it to Ginger 
And I say, look, look what Jason sent me. And she looks at Zach and she says, oh, he sure is a hinkle, isn't he? <laughs> so what, it's not complicated, but what made her say that? She saw a resemblance. She, she, she identified something, right? She saw a resemblance. She recognized features. Yeah. Well, visual, visual characteristics are one way, one way to recognize people. Okay. But there may be other ways. Right. Visible or are there invisible ways? Oh, okay. So, sure, if you're talking about um, the question that really got us going was, how do you recognize God if he's not always visible, but when he has been described as being visible, he's, a, he's appearing in different ways. You think, of, I mean, many things come to mind, but uh, off the top of our head, he appears to Abraham in one way. He appears to Moses in a different way. Gideon. Gideon, right. And Eli yeah. Elijah. Elijah, which is not a visual thing at all. It's another thing, which is back to your point. It's not always Visual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not framing it and locked in a certain way. Right. Like my hug and well, stuff. Well, I want one of that, those two. But if it can happen, right. it will. Look around you. Do you recognize God? Do you see him? Close your eyes. Close them. I can see you. How do you see God? Who is he? What's he doing? So how do you recognize someone? Only by seeing him? Have you heard God? A few years ago, I won't say how many, I went to my 40th high school reunion and I was sitting in a row. Why are you laughing? Okay. <laughs> I was sitting in a row, and I was, happened to be talking to an acquaintance that uh, actually was one of my classmates that I hadn't seen in 40 years. And we were sitting there talking and waiting for the Sabbath school and, and church program to begin. And behind me, I heard someone say, that's got to be Milton Hinkle. What? This person can't even see me. I'm rows ahead. And I turned around. Paul was there. I said, Paul, what? How did you know it was me? He goes, I would recognize that voice anywhere. Well, I'm sure glad nothing's changed in 40 years, I said. <laughs> and to that, there was lots of laughter. Must I see God to recognize him? Let's start. Has God ever introduced himself to anyone? I'm going to start. I'm going to read you uh, from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor in me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and that you are your people unless you're with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I'm pleased with you and I know your name. And Moses said, All right. Then show me who you are. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, okay, but it may not be just exactly the way you think. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will pro proclaim the name 
my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place over there in that rock, in that crevice, and I want you to go stand in there. And when I pass by, I will put my hand over your face. You stay hidden there, and I will cover you with my hand, and I will pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. Do you recognize God? Now from here, Moses then went out. He had to carve two new tablets of stone. You know the story. And produce again the commandments and begin his journey. How did God introduce himself to Moses? How did Moses know who God was? This self-description in response to Moses' request to see God's glory. Moses wanted to recognize God's presence, his glory. Moses wanted everyone to know that God was with him so they would believe in him. God responds, I'll do what you ask, but here's how it's going to work. I will come with my goodness, proclaim my name as Lord, and pass before you, but you will not see my face. So how does God say he will be recognized? You will recognize me by my characteristics, by my character, loving, faithful, compassionate, gracious, merciful. I am the judge, goodness, and the eradicator of sin. Now, hearkening back to this moment, back to creation and to this and to this moment between Moses and God, John in the book of John introduces Jesus and illuminates God's purpose. So I'm going to turn to John 1. Some of these verses may be familiar to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus came to reveal God's character. Studying the life of Jesus is our key to recognizing God. God wants us to recognize him, not with a specific face, not how tall he is, or how big he is, or how bright he is, but what he has done for you and for me. He is our creator, our life giver, light, full of grace and truth. Jesus made it very clear how God can be recognized in his character. In John 14, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you will know him 
and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in, in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. If you love me, you will obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you a counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whosoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by, by my Father, and I too will love him and show him to myself. Jesus says, anyone who spends time with him knows God. I am the Father, and the Father is within me. So what are some of the characteristics in Jesus' life that revealed God to others? We know his miracle, but sometimes that's not enough. Listen to the words of Jesus these familiar, from these familiar stories, and you can recognize God through his word, what he's saying to us today. Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm coming to your house today. You recognize those words. What is it that Jesus is saying about God? He's compassionate. I'm caring. When you see compassion and caring, fellowship, acceptance, understanding, with these actions, you can recognize God. Woman, your faith has healed you. Do you see God? It's not the good we do, but it's the good God can do through us, through our faith, that helps us recognize God. Bring the basket of fish and bread to me. You recognize the story. Do you recognize God? Being aware of others' needs and then acting to meet their needs in spite of the surroundings or others' limited sight, they can see God. Let the little children come to me. Do you see God in those words? All are worthy of the kingdom of God. Deny no one who seeks his face. But whoever drinks the water that I will give them shall never thirst. Do you see God in those words? Sharing the good news of what God has done for you, recognizing God in your life through his saving grace. It's real and it's spectacular. You remember our call to worship this morning from Chronicles. 
Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And we stop. God, I want to see you. I want to recognize you. I long to see your face. But, but, but sometimes... As Mild already referenced, um, the Gospel of John was written by a personal friend of and an eyewitness to Jesus. That first chapter has some of the Bible's most profound and poetic language in it, in my estimation, but English major, so you know it has some, some weight. It also has prob- maybe one of the saddest statements in all the Bible. He, this is John 1, 10 and 11, he, meaning Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Ouch. Milt's helping us to understand how we can recognize God through attributes, through characteristics, and that's important. We also have to be aware of the things that can keep us from recognizing God. It's the other side of the coin. I guess he's positive and I'm negative, or sunshine and overcast, I don't know. But we need to know what kind of things can keep us from recognizing God. So there might be 300 of them. We're going to just look at three this morning briefly, so stay with me. First one is time. To recognize something means that you have to be familiar with that, and familiarity takes time. I like Ford Mustangs. I know what they look like. I know the design features that distinguish different years. I know there's a yellow 2006 GT convertible in a tiny car lot off of Newhall Avenue and that they have happened to drop the price by about $2,000 in the past two weeks. Now, how do I know all this? If only it were a manual instead of an automatic. (laughs) Now, how do I know all this? It's because I see it a lot as I drive from our place to the 14 freeway. And I may have gone online to check out some particulars, like mileage, 128,550 miles. <laughs> I recognize Mustangs because I've spent a lot of time looking at them. I hope to one day spend some time driving in one, but maybe you already put that together. <laughs> now, I know that Andrew and Jacob are not here today, but just put your hand up if you guys know Andrew and Jacob, the twins. Okay. I know them as well. I know what they look like. I could recognize the twins, but I'm confessing to you, maybe maybe I'm glad they're not here for this part. If I was only speaking to one of them right now, I have maybe a 60% chance of calling him by the right name. If I saw them both together, that goes up to 80%. But Linda and Scott, their mom and dad on the other hand, On the other hand, they know the design features that distinguish those models. They know them because they spend time around them, looking at them and listening to them. One of the things that keeps us from recognizing God is time, or specifically, the lack of it. Do we spend enough time of ours looking for him, listening to him? Do we seek his face out? Or do we take the time to think about all the wonderful acts that God has done for us? Lots of duties. This is not a newsflash to you guys. Lots of duties and interests and activities and responsibilities and pursuits compete for our time. God would love some of that time too. You know, if only he could just like set apart like a few hours, like a time out where we didn't have to worry about jobs or money or school or tests or homework and all we had to do 
was use that time to become more familiar with God. Man, can you write that down? That's a good idea. If only there was something like that. The good news is that if you take time to seek God's face, he will reward you. You may have already experienced that in your life. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God himself says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In Psalms 34, 3 to 6, David says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and listen to this, their faces are never covered with shame. And John 1, 12, this is the rest of the story, the companion piece to the, one of those saddest statements, in my opinion. The rest of that complete thought says, yet to all those who do receive him, who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Time, thing one. Thing two, expectations. Now, let's imagine that we are living at the time when the calendar is changing over from B.C. to A.D. Answer these questions for me. Do you expect the Almighty Creator to come to Earth as a helpless baby? Do you expect shepherds to be the first people to greet the King of Kings? Do you expect His first miracle to be changing water to some kind of beverage that people enjoy at a wedding reception? Do you expect the Messiah to be homeless? Do you expect him to hang out with Riff Raff? Do you expect him to just sit there and take it as Roman soldiers beat him? Do you expect him to care so much for people who seem to care so little about him? If you answered no to any of these questions, then you too might have not been able to recognize Emmanuel, God with us, when he's standing right in front of you. God is infinite and we are finite. Or as God puts it in Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our expectations of God are going to be incomplete at best and counterproductive at worst. Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist, the same one referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this same cousin struggled to recognize God through the prism, with an M, although it might have been an O-N as well, through the prism of his own expectations. In Luke 7, when John sends two messengers to ask, he's got to send those messengers because he can't ask them in person because he's in prison for speaking truth to power. That's the story. I'm not going to get off track on that. But that's why he has to send messengers. And he sends messengers to Jesus with the most astounding question. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When Jesus heard the messenger's question from his cousin John, he didn't rebuke John. He simply told the messengers to be witnesses. And he used words that would evoke the messianic language of Isaiah. In verse 21, Luke 7, verse 20, 21, Jesus says, Go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. If we are not careful, we might stumble over a few of our expectations, our limited expectations of an unlimited God. But did you notice? Not all expectations of God are bad. Healing the blind, the deaf, the lame, raising the dead, proclaiming good news, these were the expectations that Jesus was fulfilling. So we've talked about time, we've talked about expectations. Third thing is misappropriation. Pastor Greg's not here today, so I thought I'd throw in a big word so you don't miss him too much. <laughs> what do I mean by misappropriation? Well, I simply mean to use something for the wrong purpose, to misuse something. Here's some examples. Specifically, when we make a God out of something that is designed to direct us to God, 
but not be the God, it might make it hard for us to recognize God. Try to follow, follow me. The first is the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Jesus healed lots of people on the Sabbath, which was great news for all those people he healed. This was a big problem, however, for the Pharisees. In John 9, a man who was born blind, I love this story. I love this story. A man who was born blind is brought before the Pharisees, and he explains to them that the reason I can see is this person called Jesus. And the Pharisees say, he can't be from God because he's breaking the Sabbath. He does not keep the Sabbath. Now, to their credit, some Pharisees who took the other side of the argument and said, really? How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So it wasn't all the Pharisees, let's be clear. But if you were in that group that says, this guy can't be from God because he's not keeping the Sabbath, if your understanding of the Sabbath gets you to a place where you believe that healing is a violation, if you think that the Lord of the Sabbath is a Sabbath breaker, then you've misappropriated the day that was designed to help us draw, draw closer to God. Second example of misappropriation, misuse, is the scriptures. What? Did I just really say that? First Sabbath and now scriptures? Yes, follow me. In John 5, Jesus is responding to people who were questioning his authority. And believe it or not, that happened quite a lot. In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus says, You who are questioning me, study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, Jesus, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now, can you imagine reading God's word and not being able to recognize God? If you can imagine that, you've misappropriated scriptures. Reading the Bible is important, of course. It testifies about Jesus, drawing us to the one who offers us eternal life. God loves us. He wants to bless us and keep us. He wants to make his face shine upon us and give us peace. I want to recognize him. I want to recognize him, don't you? even if that means moving aside some of the barriers that are blocking my view. We hope you discovered that God is not a God in the box. When you closed your eyes and when you thought about God, I venture to say of the 130 people that are here, there were 130 pictures and they were different. What do we do? How, how do you know when you're there to recognize God routinely, not allowing things to interfere? What do we do with that? Let me suggest to you that it's most easiest to recognize God when you become his child, when you respond to his word, your experience is not mine. Mine is different. Everyone's is different. Our New Testament reading this morning gives us a good start in understanding the opportunities to recognize God. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Does that sound familiar? I and my father are one. I want you to be one in me. And I will send you the spirit so that we can all be connected. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. Receive and accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Do you see God? Do you recognize him now? This is love. 
not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Step two. So when God lives in us, we will recognize him. And through our words and actions, others just might recognize God too. When we allow God to lead in our lives, we will be successful in our relationship with him. Are you spending enough time with God? Only by allowing God's will to work through you will others be re recognize who God is. God said, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's God's power that transforms. It's God's power which brings goodness, shows love, gives grace, and then you see him. Mark my word, I still want a big hug. I still want it under the tree of life. That dream will not go away. But I do realize there are many ways in which God can be recognized and be seen. And I pray that God gives me the opportunity to share that and emulate him for others. God, recognizing God, visible or invisible. It is God's love and grace that are the salve which opens up our eyes and cures our blindness so that we all can recognize God. So I found this story online. It's by Tyan Sheldon Rao. I will read it from right here so that you're listening to the words and not distracted by anything else. She writes, My son Isaac, lifted the items out of our cart one by one and placed them carefully on the conveyor belt. A bunch of bananas, two dozen eggs, and an egg dyeing kit. When the cashier announced the amount we owed, Isaac took the credit card from my hand, skillfully swiped it through the payment terminal, and handed it to me without looking my way. His eyes were transfixed on the receipt that rose curled from the register on aisle three. You have a nice day, the, cash the cashier said, as I folded the receipt and tucked it into my wallet. Isaac didn't move from the end of the aisle. He was happy in watching customers come and go. I lifted our bag of groceries into the cart and touched his arm. Wait, I said. Wait. I need to go to customer service. You need to wait for me. Waiting is not easy for Isaac. And I always wonder what's going to happen. He's a wild card. Will he sprint toward the automatic doors by the credit union, laughing when he sees people entering the store? Or will he stand nearby for a few short minutes and express his displeasure, displeasure by screaming? Will he stare endlessly at people who are buying groceries? I hoped Isaac's patience would be longer than the line. As luck would have it, there were a gazillion people in line. A woman wanting to mail a package, a man with a mail order, a woman who needed to buy stamps. Every Tuesday, I drive Isaac to our local Hy-Vee grocery store, whether or not anything's on my shopping list. He also goes with my husband, Chris, every Saturday for our weekly grocery haul. And he's there any day in between when we need an item or two. I'd guess Isaac visits the store five times a week. That's a grand total of about 260 visits a year. If the grocery store were an airport, we'd be frequent flyers. Nobody gives us the evil eye, and I've never heard a manager or an employee say anything rude. Even years ago, when Isaac spent considerable time playing with the automatic doors, we've always felt welcome in the store, which is one of the reasons we return so often. If Isaac could put a bed in aisle four and convince management to turn most of the lights off by 9.30, he'd likely move in. Fortunately, Isaac was content to wait while I stood in line. He stayed about 15 yards from me, his eyes glued to the checkout lanes. I wondered how long he'd stay there without taking off and abandoning our cart. After a few minutes of waiting, an older man wearing a blue plaid shirt walked towards the front of the line. I wasn't going to let him 
get in front of me no matter what he needed. What if my son ran off before I was helped? Didn't he know it was a gamble for me to be in line in the first place? Didn't he know by looking at my gray hair and the bags under my eyes that my son has autism? Suddenly, I found myself at the front of the line explaining what I needed to the woman behind the customer service counter. His mind is always thinking, isn't it? It's going a million miles an hour, she said. I looked at the older gentleman who'd been trying to cut in line. Was that an offhanded comment directed towards him? Was his mind going a million miles an hour trying to find ways to cut in line? Had she seen him do this before? Then it hit me. She was talking about Isaac. Of course she had seen us often in the store and knew we were together. I nodded and pulled out a pile of receipts. We just love when he comes in here, she said. Her words were genuine and so was her smile. I couldn't believe it. We just love when he comes in here. That's so nice of you to say, I stammered, struck silent for a bit. We're here a lot. He loves coming in here. She nodded. Is it the bright colors he likes? Oh, it's the whole experience. The people coming and going, the automatic doors, the loudspeaker, the conveyor belts, the elevator by the bathrooms, the sound when an item is scanned at the registers. It would be his dream to work here, I think, I said. She nodded and continued scanning my receipts. He has autism, I added. His diagnosis is something I don't disclose in public unless someone really needs to know. Because she was so friendly and interested, I wanted to tell her. She didn't say anything. She looked at me compassionately, as though she'd known her entire life that a little boy named Isaac had been diagnosed with autism 11 years earlier. He's even looked at me in the eye before, she said proudly. Her statement made me wonder if she too knew and loved someone with autism. She counted the money and placed it in my hand. As I opened my purse, she said, thank you, you two have a good day. Then she paused and really looked at me. She saw me, she saw Isaac. This is what I saw in her kind eyes and heard in the tone of her voice. I've seen you in this store a million times. I've seen your son walk with you hand in hand. I've seen him give you a kiss on the cheek. I bet you're tired. I bet you're frustrated at times. I bet some days you feel like the luckiest mama in the world. I've seen your son's love for the automatic doors. I've seen your son's love for the elevator by the bathrooms. I've seen the love you have for your son. I've seen the love your son has for you. Your son is incredible. We love, we just love when he comes in here. Isaac was still standing in the same location, gazing out into a sea of people, of carts, and conveyor belts. It's time to go, Isaac, I said. Push the cart out. The moment I stepped outside, my eyes were filled with tears. Isaac's been to Hy-Vee a few thousand times in his short life. Although employees had been friendly enough, no one had spoken up until today. We just love when he comes in here. I heard, you matter, your son matters, we appreciate differences, we just love when he comes in here. On the drive home, I fought back tears, bit my lip, and dabbed my eyes with a tissue. Like usual, I drove the long way home, past the library and coffee shop and McDonald's, and up the hill to the car wash, because the routine makes Isaac happy. I was happy too because a stranger who didn't have to say anything was considerate enough to share her encouraging words with me. It only took one kind heart and eight words. We just love when he comes in here. Do we recognize God in that story? So I was wondering, really, how, how do we recognize God? We yeah. should ask ourselves, how, how has God revealed himself to us and to others? Yeah, and we, all, we should also be thinking about what are the obstacles or things that keep us from recognizing God? True. And, and do we have a part in revealing God to others? Questions roll through my mind. Do we have opportunities to do that that we miss? Oof. Boy, that's a lot. That's a lot to think about. You know what? It would be great if we could share this with people. It, that would be. May, maybe, just maybe, Greg will call us up sometime and say, hey, c can you guys uh, step in and have something to share? 
Well, we'd sure need God's help. Well, that we sure would. Hey, let's have a prayer. All right. All right. Lord, thank you that Pete and I could be here at Barstucks and take time and yeah, we're we're interested in in our fantasy foot uh, baseball teams and football and others, but Lord, t today somehow the Spirit has brought us to a point that brought a question: How do we recognize recognize you? Who are you in our lives? How are you a part of it? Where can we see you? Lord, give us some, uh, some ideas. Help us to spend time this week. Contemplate on, on those questions. You have called us for a special purpose. And we'd like to respond. It's fun when we recognize you. I know it would be fun for others. Amen.